come here. I've met Steve Hall in the spring when he was here visiting our farm. And uh, Steve has spent his professional life uh, working with the Russet Burbank variety of potatoes in, in, uh, in all aspects of the production of it, the nutrition, the, uh, the physiological condition of seed potatoes, and, and also uh, help to help, and also in, in harvesting potatoes to help eliminate uh, damages, you know, that gets caused by harvesting. So we've asked him to come in and speak with us before we harvest this year, and hopefully, Hopefully the information that he leaves with us, it'll help us be more, be more productive and more successful. So, thank you, Steve. Okay, well, thank you. Okay. Thanks for having me. Another one of those fun flights across the country. Got to motel about two this morning in Moncton. So, uh, the crop that you've got in the field right now is 100% bruise free. There's no damage on it at all unless you ran over the rows with a sprayer. I wouldn't say you did or didn't because I don't know. <laughs> okay, we got, a, we got a room there for improvement. What causes bruises? Anybody? Impacts. When a potato hits something, that's hard. It could be plastic, it could be wood, it could be metal, anything hard, including rocks. If the impact is severe enough that the tissue, the cell structure at and below the skin level cannot flex enough to absorb that energy of the impact, the cells get broken. When the cells break, there's some tannin pigments in there that become exposed to air. So we get an oxidation of the tannin pigments where that's where the black color comes from in a black spot bruise. So if we could way oversimplify the whole scenario, way oversimplify it. If we don't allow gravity to play any role in moving our potatoes from the soil to the pile in the storage, we have no bruise. But gravity's cheap, it's consistent and reliable, and it has a price. Most potatoes, up to about 12 to 14 ounces, will survive an eight inch drop without damage. You go higher than eight inches, and the energy of impact, the velocity of the free fall when some piece of equipment lets loose of it and it falls to the next piece, the impact energy then starts to get high enough that we exceed the elastic limits of the cell structure. So we start getting bruise. The farther they drop, the bigger the bruised area. So a small drop will give you a smaller bruise, a bigger drop will give you a larger area of discoloration. Now those are scorable defects. Those are things that we can't erase. Once they're bruised, that's, that's the end result. Now if the temperatures are fairly warm, we typically will see mostly black spot bruise, which is a black mass of tissue some distance below the skin, usually an eighth to a quarter of an inch. If the temperatures are a little on the cooler side and the field is particularly well hydrated, in other words, the ground's pretty moist and it's been fairly wet for a while, the roots don't die as quick as the tops do. So they keep pumping water into the tubers. So they get very firm, kind of like filling a water balloon with more and more water, it gets under pressure. When they're cold like that and well hydrated, and they drop, they hit, and the energy of impact can't be absorbed quick enough. So we get cracks. We call them shatter bruises. They're little cracks. If you've seen potatoes that were packed and put in the grocery shelf, they've been there for four, five, 10 days. You see those arcs, those little cuts in the skin? You seen those? 
those are impacts that weren't great enough to cause a bruise, but the reason they're arcs, if you think of a pebble dropped into a pond of, of calm water, you get these rings radiating out from where the pebble hit. When an impact hits that potato tissue, there is a shock wave that radiates out. And some point around that impact, the tissue can't absorb that amount of expansion contraction. So we get those arcs. Some call them like thumbnail, thumbnail cracks is another term for them. Yeah. And that's drops that are uh, not bad enough to give you a black spot, but from the customer's standpoint, surely a visible defect. Visible defects are a little harder for the customer to be comfortable with than the ones they can't see, like hollow heart or brown center or uh, sprain or heat necrosis, things that are internal to the tissue. They'll see them later when they cook them and serve them. And then your name will be used, not kindly. But uh, the physical damage to the exterior of the potato is extremely important in the fresh market because that's how the quality is established. If the potato is smooth and, and typey for its type of variety and free of defects, it makes a high grade, returns very good money. If it doesn't, it's harder to sell and generally at a lower price. Potentially, when you break the skin of the potato, you open the door for decay organisms to get in. You don't want to do that. The skin on a potato is kind of like the skin on your arm. As long as you got no cuts, you don't get any infection. You get a little scratch, you might get a little infection because now the pathogen can get in and start working on your tissue. Same thing happens in a potato tuber. So we don't want to break the skin because that's our barrier to protect that potato from the kinds of problems that might develop. And depending on how long they're held uh, and how well they heal when you put them in storage and then what damages occur coming out of storage before they're off to market somewhere, those things all add up. So we have a number of opportunities for problems to occur. The thumbnail cracks are the result of a change in tuber temperature. So if your potato coming out of storage is, let me use Fahrenheit temperatures, because we don't use centigrade enough or, or Celsius for me to keep switching back and forth. If your potato comes out of storage at 50 degrees Fahrenheit, you put it in the truck, you drive it over here, you bring it in, and you put it into the system here in the shed. If you run it through a wash water vat or a spray, if that water is colder than that tuber flesh, the exterior of the tuber cools first because it's in direct contact with that water. It wants to shrink because you're cooling it. But the inside of the tuber says, no, uh -uh, I'm not cool yet. I'm not ready to shrink. So the surface tension on the exterior of that tuber develops. And that's what causes the thumbnail cracks. An impact that's so light that it won't show a bruise, but as that ripple radiates out, it finds a place where the, the, tissue, the tissue can't flex enough and it separates. Now in the shed you won't see those symptoms. They're not visible. It takes two or three days for them to lose enough water to open up so that now you can see them. So when you're evaluating the finished product here in the package ready to ship, they might look excellent. So, to, so, so, now, so that can be caused by, even if we're not cracking the potatoes, I 
Especially the ones on the top of the pile. Yeah, yeah. So they become quite vulnerable in that respect. And they won't survive a four inch drop. So when you look at your line and the pieces of equipment those potatoes go through and the transfer from one belt or system to another, how many four inch drops do you have? None, probably because the head rollers on the belts are bigger than that. And when you go around a roller about two thirds of the, the way from the bottom side up, or in other words, right about here, is where the potato leaves the belt and becomes a free fall. And so if you're transferring potatoes from one device to another, again, we want to take gravity out of that picture. So let me just draw you a an example here, if we've got a belt with a head roller in it and we're delivering that to the next device, whatever it is, and this distance from here, try not to stand in front of you, from here down is, is the free fall height of that potato in that situation. So to mitigate that drop, we come just below center, right about here, and we put a letdown slope. That can be steel, it can be rubber belting, it can be wood, anything you're comfortable with that you feel is, is easily sanitized so you're not going to spread problems with it. So that potato is only going to drop to here and then roll down. So from every single device that your potatoes travel across. You don't want gravity playing a role getting them out of the back of the truck into the chain or belt that you're bringing them in the, the doorway with and then all the different pieces of equipment. So there are potentially many hundreds of dollars worth of damage in every truckload that can be avoided. It doesn't have to happen. It, it's often a little bit different thinking about what it is you want to accomplish and how you're going to do it. The old method that's been around for a long time, kind of pro, uh, tried and tested and proven, you're pretty comfortable with. That's well within your comfort zone. When somebody like me comes in and says, you might want to change something. Change is scary because there's unknowns. So when you want to make a change, allow that you need to have somebody who has worked with that. I don't care who it is, whether it's me or somebody else. Help you set it up. Take the benefit of their experience and use it to implement the new approach because that's where the problems would come. And if I said, let's make a change, and here's all it is, go do it. Well, first thing that might enter your mind is there's probably 50 ways to do that. And only 48 of them are not gonna work. So what's my odds of having a success? You know, there's too many unknowns. You don't know, and you don't wanna spend a lot of time making something that's not going to help you. How much of a temperature difference is there before that becomes an issue? About five degrees Fahrenheit. So it isn't very much. That temperature thing is something that we typically ignore because we can't see it and we often aren't poking probes to find out what it is. In seed, you have to get the temperature up warm enough that you can handle that whole potato as a seed potato and then cut it without physical damage. You don't want shatter bruise or 
uh, cracks developing in your seed because that's another place for decay to find its way in. When you plant seed, you want the temperature of the tissue of that seed piece to be within five degrees of the soil temperature at the depth where you're going to put it in order to avoid a physiological shock reaction. Now, what do I mean by that? If I was to throw you into a great big tub of ice water, you could tell me right away what physiological shock feels like. <gasps> I think I'm going to die. But that's what the potato thinks if you're putting it from a warm condition coming out of storage and through the cutter and then to the field and the ground out there is cold. Plus the wound healing and suberizing, the healing processes on those cut surfaces and any other injuries that might have occurred, that process just barely begins at 48 degrees Fahrenheit. Just barely getting started. You get up a few degrees in the low 50s and it's going very nicely. It takes two to four days for the superizing and wound healing process to be initiated. It takes about six weeks to complete it. And when you've completed it, you essentially have developed a new skin or periderm on that cut surface. What's happening there is the cells that are healthy, right below the ones that were sliced, begin to lay down subrin, which thickens their cell walls, and that's, that's how they become periderm or skin. So you want that to happen. And in an effort to defray some of the pressure from the pathogens, and, and they're pretty well everywhere, we use seed protectants, those seed treatments, liquids or dries. A lot of guys in the West now are using both because they have different modes of action. So we want as much protection as we can get. If we lose that seed piece, we got nothing for the rest of the year except the cost of farming a missing hill. And we don't get 100% stands with a mechanical planter. That just doesn't happen. If you can get a low 90s, 92, 93% stand, you have done phenomenally well. Most growers across North America are in the mid to upper 70s, occasionally low 80s. Because they're doing the best they can, but they're in a hurry to get done too. Being in a hurry means compromises. Things you probably know you should do, but man, I'd like to be done a week early. So I don't want to slow down and be more careful. So let's just go. And, and they do. Now, how bad is an 80% stand? Well, if you had a 100 acre field out there somewhere, and you could put all the plants in 80 acres of it, you'd have 100% stand in those 80, but you got to farm the other 20, and you're going to get zero back from it. You got to put water out there, you got fertilizer, you got seed, you got spraying, you got harvest costs. You got to do that to that 20 acres and you aren't going to get a single potato back out of it. So getting a stand is the first really important thing to achieve in the spring. If you've got that, that says, okay, the door is open now for a really good crop. We don't know what the weather's going to do to us. Hopefully it's decent, but we can't change that. So we got to do the best we can in tracking what we're doing for that crop to address its needs in consideration of the way the plant's growing under the weather patterns that you get. And there are growers who do that very, very well. In the West, there's guys that, uh, well, I know several of them that I work with that have six to 8,000 acre farms and they grow 800 sack and higher yields on the entire farm every year. So they, they can be done. Now I'm not suggesting 800 sacks would likely occur here unless you double planted them or something, dug four rows and called it two. But a sack is 100 pounds. 
Sacks 100 pounds, yeah. So is that the normal units that you guys use as sacks or do you use tons or? We generally refer to 100 weight, but that's okay. the best. Okay, all right, all the same thing. sure. Yeah, that's good. The point he just made is extremely important. The whole process of growing this crop is like a long chain with many links to it. And the strength of that chain or the success that you're going to achieve in the end is based on the weakest link in that chain. Whatever you didn't do right or didn't quite do as good as you could have is the weak link. And that holds everything from going as far as it could. One of the real big weak links in the system is communication. Uh, you guys, in my opinion, should look at each other as part of your team. Everybody needs to have a specific job or, or several jobs to accomplish, but they need to know what's going on with the other folks too. That line of communication is very, very important. If you don't know something that's going on in the field and all of a sudden you're receiving raw product that uh, is different somehow and you don't recognize it, big problems can develop. So if the guys in the field are letting the guys here in the shed or in the storage know what's going on, then those surprises don't happen. The potato industry as a whole does not like surprises because most of the time they're negative. Once in a while you say, man, the yield's bigger than I thought. Well, that's a great surprise to have, but most of them aren't positive. They have consequences. So an open line of communication between each and every one of you in some fashion, to the extent that it's productive, is very important to the overall smooth flow of, of the operation and everything that happens from step one to the last step. And that's shipping product out the door. So once it leaves here, packed, you don't have much control over it from then on. But up till then, you have all the control or should have. So mistakes or errors or omissions are the weak links in the chain. And even though you might have made a mistake, and you don't do it deliberately, other people need to know that because they can compensate and adjust a little bit for what's happened. If it's held as a secret, they don't know and they keep going like, well, nothing's wrong, everything's just normal. And that leads to bigger problems. So uh, I want to keep this session as open and free exchange as possible. So anytime I say something that doesn't quite register or seems a little different or you don't quite understand all of what it means, please say so, so we can talk about it a little bit more. The odds are, if, if you're thinking that, there are several people in the room that are also, in their mind, thinking the same thing. If, if I might elaborate, uh, just to bring some things to attention, uh, I've backfired my memory to go, but there's, uh, we have to have a little joke. Owen has a joke here, but Owen say he's the only man that's worked here longer than I have, and, uh, and it's actually he's worked with the father. But I can remember, started having two-way radios for communication one day, he called me and he said, he, I was in the same area, he called them two-way, he said, where are you? And I told him that I could look across the water and see in the factory. And he said, right where I am, there's something wrong with the potatoes underneath me. Right where I'm sitting, right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I went over there, of course, it was late flight that had struck the crop very early in the stage. And at that time, the, at that time in our production, we were coloring our potatoes with the tops were that high. Okay. And that's where he was, and that's where the crop growth crop stage was. Well, because of because of the immediate communication, we were able to react to that. Sure. And start to you know start to mitigate our you know the problems. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing. Some of the men have called me 
they'd be harvesting Canadians and they'd say, well, the rig where I am is rotten tubers, or the things are rotten, or there's a problem, and quite often it would be decay, and, and people were knowledgeable enough driving the equipment that they'd know that that signifies, that, that signals an alarm. Mm -hmm. and exactly. And then when you're aware of that, and there's a truck just loaded here, and I'm afraid there's some on that, I didn't see it till, I, till now. And so then you can stop that truck from unloading in the back end of the storage somewhere, treat it differently, or manage it differently, mm -hmm. or something. So that's where I just want to reiterate that communication in that respect is so important. And even though if what they suggest to you ends up not being, uh, not being uh, significant, needs to be observed first to decide whether it's significant or not. I guess I don't know, I'm not doing that terminology, but... No, I, I, I think you're, what you've said is, is exactly right. The right hand needs to know what the left hand is doing, <coughs> and vice versa. And any time you see something that is a little abnormal, you'll probably see it fairly often, say something. Don't fear that somebody's going to say, oh, you don't know what you're looking at, and you know, you're, maybe you've been drinking too much or something. I don't know what it'd be, but um, your eyes are as good as everybody else's in here. And the more eyes you have looking at the system, the whole process from start to finish, the more likely you are to identify problems and then find a way to react to them to minimize their consequence. We don't have any real cures in the potato industry. What we have that works quite well, if it's done properly, is preventative reactions. We can prevent a problem by our practices and our products and our methods and our equipment, but if the problem's there, we can't cure it. So we don't want to deal with the problem, we want to make it not happen. And that applies with all the chemicals that we spray, all the fertilizers we use. We've got to put those on before the problem develops, not once we see it or after the fact. So there's, there's important issues there that, that need to be you know, identified first. You've got to spot them. And once you know that something's wrong there, there's probably somebody else that you could communicate that with that can help sort it out. And they might not know initially when they walk in, and, yeah, it does look a little different, but I don't know what it is. But those kind of folks are able to go find somebody who does. Bring them in, get their opinion, maybe run some lab tests of some sort to confirm that it is what you thought it might be, and then set a course or a plan in place to deal with that issue. So we, we, we want to prevent problems. We can't cure them. And once they develop, we've lost some money. Now the bruise thing in potatoes really got going aggressively in the West back in the early 80s. Prior to that, there was no bruise penalties, there were no incentives, uh, the bruise is what it was. And everybody just expected it to be part of the quality of the crop as delivered. Then the processors started looking at how much trim labor they had to have on the line to remove all those defects. Bruises in fresh or in process or chips are considered scorable defects. Scorable defects are allowed to a certain extent, major ones and minor ones. If you can't stay under this, the limits that are set for a particular grade or pack out, then you can't use them for that purpose. So we want to prevent the bruise. We can't cure it once it's happened. And so we want to look at what is, what's the, the vulnerability of that potato. What do we got to do to avoid losing the quality that's in the field right now? Because like I said when I started, 
most of those potatoes in the field are 100% damage free. And that's the way we want to keep them. So if we allow them to be handled a little roughly, then there are potential problems there. And, and we'll get into timing on the harvesters and adjustments and cushioning and, and so forth and loading trucks and unloading trucks before we're done today. Those are all very critical aspects of that whole process and, and we don't want to ignore them. So, any questions so far? Anything doesn't quite isn't quite clear. Okay. So this healing aspect also applies in storage. When you bring the crop out of the field and put it in a pile, there may have been some physical injury occurred in that effort, Get, digging them out of the ground, loading them, hauling them in, unloading them, and putting them on the face of the pile. That's the temperature at which the metabolic processes within the potato tissue can begin to wound, heal, and superize. So theta has to be 48 degrees to superize. Yeah. In some university studies that were done in Washington some years ago, probably 10 or 12 years ago, in growth chambers where they could control the temperature absolutely precisely, 24 hours a day, at 45 degrees Fahrenheit, they cut potatoes, sterilized them, cut them with a sterilized knife, and they put them in sterilized soil in pots. So there were no pathogens there. They didn't want the seed to rot. And at 45 degrees, after 100 days, they took that seed out, washed it off, sliced it very thin slices with what they call a microtome. It's something they cut super thin slices to look at on, on a slide under a microscope. And there was absolutely no healing after 100 days at 45 degrees. So that's why I say at 48, it just barely begins. Now, your weather patterns, especially in the latter part of your harvest, may have some colder nights, probably do most years. Growers in the west, in the higher elevations, uh, eastern Idaho, they're up around 5,000 foot elevation, so they're kind of pretty close to the top of the mountains. They will wait until one or two or three in the afternoon to start harvesting. They wait for that tuber to get as warm as it's gonna get in that 24 hour cycle and they begin digging then, and they'll dig to two or three or four in the morning. So that heat has warmed the ground, and that's the warmest interval during the 24-hour cycle where they can pull those potatoes out of the field and get them into the storage or the fresh shed or wherever they're going with the least amount of damage. Uh, if you're using refrigerated storages, be extremely careful not to put more heat units in the storage per day than you have cooling capacity to take out. Because all you're doing is building a great big heat sink in there that is in a perfect condition for problems to develop. And it's gonna take a long time to bring that whole pile back down to where you'd like it to be so that they will keep long term. So you don't, you don't want to put too much in per day. So uh, right now at home, there, the temperatures there are, um, well, yesterday was 88. Today is supposed to be in the 90s. So we're up in the 30C range. They're digging till about 10, 30, 11 o'clock in the morning and quitting. But they start about three. So they're trying to dig in the coolest part of the day 
because we got too much heat yet in our weather patterns. That will reverse later on when they have too much cooling at night and they want to use whatever warming they can get during the day to make them as good as they can get. You still got to dig them, but you don't want to dig them in the worst possible conditions. So those things are management decisions and management will make decisions based on all the information that they have to factor in to that process. This is again where that line of communication comes in. If you see something happening, you see potatoes that are cracked or broken or whatever, let them know. Because they won't change their decision until they have new information that factors into all the variables they have to consider to make a choice. So, so in our stories, when we're filling our stories, is after we've done our best to get them in there, get the new lease by the end. Mm -hmm. Am I correct then that we should keep, allow our stories to, the potatoes go warm themselves up in a way? A certain so, amount, yeah, from so, respiration. Yeah, and so we should let that storage come up to a Look for an even number here. Just okay. 50 low 50s. Uh, low 50s for a period of how many days or weeks? Well, if you've harvested a fairly immature crop in warmer conditions, that maturity is going to affect how fast they heal. So you may need four to six weeks in the low 50s on the early storage filling. By the time you're getting to the latter storages, the last ones, the senescence and the maturity in the field has progressed farther. So they're closer to dormancy, their respiration rates are down. Two, three weeks usually is enough. Uh, one of the good ways to check it is when you're filling the storage, go up and take a nice sharp knife and slice a few potatoes and lay them on the top of the pile. You can come back and look at those a week, two weeks, three weeks later and see one, they're going to dry out on the surface, and we know that. But is there a thickened cell area below that dry tissue? That's that new skin forming to heal to give you the protection against the pathogens. And so when you're looking for how, how far along are they, uh, it's, it's not obvious and highly visible. You got to look pretty meticulously to see how far your progress has gone. So if you don't get the healing process completed, you're going to see problems developing later on, hot spots and sinking areas, and uh, especially on early harvest, you'll see sprouting because they didn't go dormant. They're trying to grow again. And wet spots contribute to sprouting. So you'll see more sprouting in the wet spots than you will in the drier parts of the storage. Uh, something you, I don't know if you do it or not. You want the top of that storage pile to be as level as this floor, absolutely smooth. Now that's pretty tricky for a pilot operator to do that. They can with a lot of experience. But oftentimes growers will send up uh, some people, uh, they'll wrap burlap or rubber cushioning around their feet and they use great big padded gloves and they're pushing these little ridges that the piler made, it's flattening those out. And then to track your pile settling and shrink, you know that plastic surveyor ribbon you see on stakes, that bright colored orange or pink or whatever color it is? Hang that from the ceiling each day while you're filling the storage down and cut it off right at the top of the pile. It'll tell you two things. One, how much the pile has settled and initially there's going to be some settling in the first three or four weeks that might be, depending on how high your pile is, is built, uh, several inches, six, eight, nine inches sometimes. And then it kind of stops. But if you see it settling more later on, that's a clue something down lower is going on that shouldn't be. And that may be a trigger to 
Okay, we're going to have to figure out a way to get that portion of that storage out and run it while we st still can sell it because it's going to go worse in time and those aren't fun things to fight. The second thing that ribbon does is it tells you something about the airflow in the attic of that storage building. Dead air spaces are not a good thing. You want air movement. It doesn't have to be very fast, but if it's like about that speed, that's okay. Headed back to the fan house. If you find over in the corners or off to the side somewhere, the ribbons are hanging straight down, they're not fluttering at all, put some fans up on top of that pile. High volume, low velocity fans, you know, big three and four foot diameter blades, like those Dayton fans. Uh, they move a lot of air, but they don't blow it too fast to cause burn or dehydration. And another thing I don't know whether you do or don't, um, in the West, a truck never leaves the field where it's being loaded until it's tarped. And it's tarped until it's empty. And then they fold the tarp up and go back and get another load. That exposure, whether it's, uh, your mosquitoes are here, uh, that exposure to the air as the truck drives down the road is very hard on those potatoes on the top of the load. We call it wind burn. It's, it's really a desiccation effect. And only about 5% of that load is going to be affected on the top. But you don't want 5% of your potatoes in the pile having a potential problem that you're going to have to react to later on. So we tarp our trucks routinely all the time. We tarp our seed. When that seed truck is loaded and goes to the field, it's got a tarp on it until the truck's empty. And then we roll the tarp up and come back for another load. So seed is more vulnerable to desiccation because we got all those cut surfaces. And light, exposure to sunlight, even though it's a cloudy day, retards sprouting activities. It delays things. You don't want seed exposed to light. So keep your seed in the dark from the time it comes out of the storage. You gotta go through the cutter, but that's only minutes, so don't worry about that. But if you've got a big even flow, cover the top of it so the lights aren't shining in there. And when you get the trucks loaded, get the tarp on them before they drive out. And that makes a big difference. Now, we're talking about brews. Can I go back to, yep. uh, light, to wind exposure to potatoes coming in at harvest time? And I have to get my mind around this because we, are, we have not been tarping our loads. Okay. 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 All right. So now I'm going to argue with myself that I always do this. So if we're two miles from storage and, and 10 miles from storage, mm -hmm. and is there much difference in the effect on the wind if it's longer periods of time? Have you, have oh, yeah. The longer the haul, the more risk you have. Yeah. But I've seen growers that were digging a field that was a quarter mile from the storage, yes. and the tarps are on there. Okay. I guess that's my question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So keeping those, that seed or that crop out of the sunlight and out of exposure to high velocity air leaves it with better quality than if you didn't do that. So yeah, it's a little more work to go pull that tarp over and, and tie it down, but that's making you money. And for the most part, that's why we all do this thing called grow potatoes. It's too much work for recreational farming and, and too much invested. Now, um, let's go back to our seed for just a minute. Let me take a seed piece that uh, was cut out of a larger tuber. So it has a cut on both ends and on the bottom. That's the, the, one of the common shapes we see coming out of the top deck of the cutter. The seed that comes out of the middle of the cutter may look like 
this or like this. You have one or two ends cut. And the seed coming out of the bottom of the cutter has no cuts on it at all. When we cut seed, the tissue of that seed piece instantly becomes the most fragile potato tissue you will have on the farm the entire year. And the economic penalties associated with bruise there are the greatest of anything during the year. Because if we drop this seed and we hit one of these corners or one of these edges, uh, just the cut ones, we don't worry about the skin side, we crush some cells. There's a very small amount of tissue on these edges and corners to absorb the energy of a drop. And that little bit of tissue can't flex enough to survive it, so it's crushed. Seed piece bruise is where 95% of seed piece decay gets in. Those are dead cells, once they're crushed, they can't heal. So even though the conditions in the field might be really good, that's not going to happen in those spots. On the flat sides, yeah, it'll heal. But if you leave the edges and corners uh, unprotected, then you potentially have open doors for decay organisms that may be on the seed itself already or in the soil where you put the seed that can enter through those dead cell areas because there's no protection when there's dead cells. And the decay only has to get one cell deep into healthy tissue to be home free. The seed protectants we have are contact materials. So once it's beyond the barrier of the surface, we can't stop it. And it's buried in the ground because we covered it with a planter and we don't see it. We did a number of studies for several years um, in Washington where we hand cut seed and we hand bruised it. We've repeated some of those studies in northern Maine down near Presque Isle. Got the same kind of responses there. The average seed piece, all sizes and shapes, by the time it's planted, has eight new bruises on it that were not present before it was cut. Now, if you take a seed piece of this shape and drop it six inches onto a hard surface, whether it's a stretch tight belt, a piece of metal or wood, whatever it happens to be, you'll bruise, if it hits a corner or an edge, 100% of the time. Cut seed cannot survive six inch drops. At a three inch drop, we get 95% bruises. If we lose a fourth of our tissue to decay, and our seed piece weighed, let's say, two ounces to start with, we've lost a half ounce of tissue. So we got a, an ounce and a half left to give that new plant a good start. An ounce and a half is not enough. The difference between ounce and a half and two and a half ounce seed pieces in production is 20% difference in yield. When yields go up, that's a sign that the effects of stresses, whatever they were, and there's all kinds of them out there, whatever those stresses were, had less effect on a real healthy plant because it had a bigger seed piece and got a stronger start than it did on a plant that was a little weak to begin with. You know that if you're in the peak of, of physical condition, very, very healthy, you don't get sick. By the end of harvest, you're run down, exhausted, and you're vulnerable to everything. Same with a plant. It's real hard to stay healthy when you're weak. So the bigger the seed piece, the stronger that plant will be. <coughs> 
So bruising on seed costs us, if, if we look at the average bruises, eight per seed piece. And we hand cut and hand bruised them so we knew exactly where the bruises were and how many in each row we planted. We did a number of them with this shape and this shape uh, and some whole ones. 20% yield reduction from seed piece bruise alone. Now, let's, let's, out of the blue, let's take a number. What's an acre of potatoes worth average price year? The cost of production is about $3,000 per acre of that's, that's, that's the number that we've acquired. Okay. What's, what's the value of that crop in the marketplace? Uh, typical, uh, just average. You know, the, uh, with, the, with the added value, I suppose with the, with the added value cost, it could be uh, $9,000. Okay. You know, just All right. Freight, freight package. Sure. Well, let's, let's say it, it's 9000 for our discussion purposes. Now, 20% yield reduction or increase, if you could avoid the bruise, is $1,800. Almost $2,000 on every single acre out there. You know what that means? Better wages, more equipment, new stuff, bigger farm, job security, all the good things that can happen when you have a very good budget to work with that don't happen when the money's tight. So an effort to minimize this seed piece bruise is a very important part of the whole scheme. The effect of bruise here is somewhere between three and five times as big in dollars as bruise on harvested crops. Because a lot of the bruise never gets seen because it's below the skin. And so they get packed and shipped and uh, only when there get to be too many of them and the inspector says, well, these don't make grade, does the process start to run money the other way. So we want to maximize our returns for the investment that's out there. And every one of you has a role or maybe several roles to play in that process. What you do is not just to fill a square. It's important to the success of the whole program. If it weren't, they wouldn't have you here doing it. So the better job you do, every one of you and everything you do, the better everything else turns out. And from my experience, very successful growers share the wealth with their people. They get new pickups more often, they get four-wheelers, uh, they get bonuses. I don't want to speak for what these guys are going to do because I don't have any clue. But when you have big money coming back, possible things uh, become real. New storage buildings that are easier to, to manage and, and maintain and the quality that you put in them. When you put potatoes in storage, they never get any better. You just hope you can keep most of that quality until it's time to unload them. When you go to the supermarket and, and buy a 10 pound bag of potatoes, okay. and you take it home and you're peeling a potato, and there's a blackish grayish yeah. spot. Little, little zone? Inside the uh -huh. potato. Is that, what is that? That is a black spot bruise. That was from an impact that didn't break the cells on the surface because it was probably fairly warm, the tuber and the soil around it, when that impact occurred. But down deeper, that, that radiating yeah. shock wave found an area that's less dense. It's, yeah. Potatoes are denser near the surface than they are in the yeah, core. That, that's what you said earlier, but I was wondering if that's... That's, that, that's, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. Now, if you see cracks, particularly on the ends, because the radiuses are narrower there than they are on the side, yeah. 
those are often shatter bruises. And that's often occurring when it's cold. Uh, most guys are careful enough, they don't get shatter bruises on the side very often, but you can if you drop them far enough. So when you load a truck and when you put potatoes into a storage pile, there are certain things that you don't want to see happen. One of them is called roll down. So let me clean this board up and we'll look at that just briefly. So when you, you build a pile of potatoes and your piler boom is sitting here and potatoes are falling off of it, they can go rolling down the slope, whether that's in the truck, to the sides, to the back, the front, wherever you started your pile. These potatoes can get up enough velocity if they roll more than about three feet to bruise themselves every time they hit and the ones they hit. So having a lot of roll down is counterproductive to achieving a high bruise free result. So in the process of filling a truck, uh, there's various different ways to do that and we've studied them extensively. We've used those electronic sensors that measure impact energies and trying to see where the threshold is. And what we found was that once we roll more than about three feet, we start getting into the risk zone where bruises begin to occur. Up to then, not too bad. The free fall drop height is straight down where potatoes will survive ends at eight inches. Anything higher than eight inches, you get up enough velocity that the energy of impact will cause a bruise on the one that falls and the one that hits maybe. The farther they fall, the faster they're going and the harder they hit. So a small fall gives you a little bruise, that little gray area, where a big one would give you quite a, uh, maybe a quarter to three eighths of an inch diameter symptom. And, and those are our defects at that point. They have the same weight as green on the surface of the potato. One bruise, you're still okay, you can make grade with it. Two bruises, depending on the standards that uh, they're graded under, may drop at a grade category. So you might go from a number one to a number two. If there's three bruises, you go to a cull. You spend all that money growing that potato, if it's got three bruises on it, it isn't worth anything. So, uh, you know, you're gonna get a few like that no matter what you do but we want to minimize it to the greatest extent possible. So let me draw kind of a cross section of a truck bed. And there's a pivot here so this side can, can fold down. Okay. All right, we'll just, just do this in about two minutes and then we'll go get something to eat. So this is looking from the back end of the truck. We've got our vertical sides, our slopes, our chain or belt in the bottom there. Uh, so this side normally is folded down if you have that feature when they begin to fill the truck. The challenge is the tractor operator, his head is right here. He can't see anything until that pile's that high. So he just doesn't know what's going on in there. It's just over the side rack. So what some of the growers that have been particularly successful at is up on the catwalk of the piler where there's a position for people to stand and pull debris and rocks and whatever they've put a set of hydraulic controls that just address the boom. 
and they have a smaller orifice in them than the one the man driving the tractor has in his controls. So the tractor driver can always override him, no matter what he's doing. He might be wanting to go down, the tractor driver says, we're going up, because uh, we're going to hit the end gate or something. And that's expensive. So this person um, that's on the harvester is watching that boom, and they can get that boom in here right down within inches of the bottom of that truck and begin to fill that pile. And what they do is they'll build a pile here on the bottom like that. Never more than two feet high. A two feet high pile has about a three foot face. There's your roll down distance. And then on the boom up here, to help the truck driver, we hang three, those rubber snubbers that you tie down tarps with work pretty good. They're cheap, they're pretty durable. Take the hook off the bottom end. And when we're filling the center of the truck, this is right on the edge, right up against it. That's how the truck driver can look in his mirror and see whether he's centered up or too far out or too close to the digger. And so this person up here is watching this boom and builds a pile the full length of the bed. Just a small one, two feet. And then they motion the truck driver to move in and they build a pile here. So he's coming over to put this belt on the edge of the truck. And they build a, a tier the full length on the far side. And once that's done, then he asks them to, to come back and put this belt right on the side of the truck here, and they build a pile here. Again, we're never going to let that potato roll more than three feet. And then they come back to the center one, and they build a pile there. And they keep doing that. Until you got a truckload. It's a different way than you're probably used to or have done in the past. But this will deliver you a, if the potatoes were bruise free in the ground, it'll deliver you a better than 90% bruise free level in the storage. Because there's virtually no damage there. Absolutely. The driver in the truck has got to be a little more attentive. He can't be daydreaming and looking around. He's got to watch those, those guides for where he is under the belt or the boom and moving back and forth in relation to the harvester. So he's filling the truck from one end to the other. Also in and out. Exactly, yeah. So you, you just build one of these the full length and then you shift the truck in or out and build the next one. And uh, it's, it's real hard to get guys who are used to filling a big pile on one end and then just building it all the way to the, the other end of the bed to do this once they've started digging. What we found is if you start out from the beginning of the year this way, then you're good to go. Because you don't have to compare this or that or whatever. But that, that points out how important that truck driver is to the success of that whole operation. If he isn't doing his job, all the efforts to grow a high quality bruise free crop are kind of out the window. And that truck driver has a huge role in preserving that quality. So I know it's different and you're skeptical, I don't know if that'll work or not. A lot of guys have been. Once they get used to it, it's pretty routine. But you got to pay attention the first couple days to make sure everybody's on the same page. Again, communications. So the tractor operator that's driving the, the tractor pulling the harvester, 
He's controlling the truck going forward or back. He's saying go forward or, or back up, as the case might be. The person up here is watching this until it gets up high enough that the tractor operator can see it. And then they go back to pulling vines. And that way, uh, the, the tractor operator, he's got control of both the speed and in and out and forward and back. So it, it does work. The same principle applies in storage. But I think we'll wait until after lunch to get into that. <laughs>